Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the host and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have problems with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios East and West, transmitting across the internet. This is episode 275 of Registry Matters. Good evening, sir. How are you? I'm doing awesome. Glad to be back with you one more time. Just once. This is the last one. I'm not putting up with you anymore. That's what I've been hoping for. Please make sure you go over and like and subscribe and notification bells. Leave five-star reviews. Don't leave anything less because that doesn't make any sense. Um, and if you're new to the show, make sure that you find you can not only find us on YouTube, but you can also use your favorite podcast app. And you can have it downloaded so you can have it on your drive to work. Or if you run out of data, you could have it well, you could have downloaded it when you were over Wi-Fi. And then you don't have to use your data anymore to listen to the program. See, if you're doing it on YouTube, you're going to consume a lot of your data, Larry. Not everybody has infinite data. I don't understand why not. The plans are cheap. They are, but, you know, my kid has a very restricted plan. And he just wears out some Instagram and he runs out of data in about 10 days. And then he's got 20 days of being miserable. He cannot ration himself. That's difficult for a teenager to do. <laughs> Would you tell us what we are up to this evening? We have a significant ruling from the state of Texas, their highest court, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. And it's gotten you all fired up, and I'm not sure why. But anyway, we have a few articles, but the bulk of it is going to be that case from, from Texas regarding PFR registration. Well, very good. Um, did you have any sort of celebrations recently? I did celebrate my 180th birthday in June. And so, okay, so since you celebrated your 180th uh, birthday. How much longer are you planning to stay? A uh, long time. Get used to me. <laughs> ha! I hit the cue on point, didn't I? That was pretty good there. Uh, I do want to bring up before we get rolling that last week... We covered an article, uh, if you're looking at the YouTube thing, there's a, there's a screen posted for, for a news release from NACDL, a National Association of Criminal Defense Attorneys. And one of our patrons wrote in, he's like, uh, just to let you know that PFRs are excluded from the revised sentencing guidelines. You may want to add that to the show notes or the transcripts. Well, there they are. We Anything have, you want to say about that? We have added it, and we're aware of it, and through the history since the... First Step Act was passed. We've occasionally called people's attention to how it was restricted by last minute amendments placed by the United States Senate and uh, by a conservative group of senators led by Senator Cotton from Arkansas. I've heard of him. Yes. He's amazing. We've encouraged people to either elect different senators if you want truly uh, criminal justice reform or convince those that led the charge for restrict those restrictions, you need to convince them to change how they vote. Have you had much success in converting people and how they vote? Very modest in terms of that, but you can occasionally with sound arguments, you actually do convert people. And I know I've had some headway here in my state, particularly in the issue of the statute limitations because the liberals have bought into the notion that justice shouldn't have an expiration date. But then when I go through all the nuances of why we have the statute of limitations and how it's unfair to a person they can't put on a defense 30, 40 years later, it actually resonates with a few of them. And occasionally you can break through, but it's difficult when they're hardwired to do a certain thing. And uh, conservatives are hardwired to believe that people in jail keep the community safe and the more the better <sighs> let's get moving because this episode is going to be amazing this is uh the 275th episode and i predict that it will be the first time larry that you will not be able to spin uh, a bad judicial decision the case is from the texas court of criminal appeals i've read this case thoroughly i like word for word i took notes i like cross-referenced i wrote line i dragged lines around to make references. I don't see any wiggle room on this one. You just won't be able to make excuses for this terrible decision. Normally, 
we would wait and do the main event. But last time, uh, we're going to do it first. I'm sorry. This time, we're going to do it first. I can't wait to finally get admission that the court got it wrong. Are you ready to spew your usual spin? I think so, yes. All right. So here we are on 274 previous attempts I've tried to get you to do this. You will finally have to admit that there's no justification for their ruling. And I'll set this up a little bit. This case was brought by David Richard Lane and arises from a conviction for the offense of failure to comply with PFR registration requirements. In this application for a post-conviction writ of habeas corpus, Lane challenged his 2007 conviction for that offense in five grounds. Actual innocence is number one. Number two, ineffective assistance of counsel. Three, involuntary plea. Four, due process violation. And five, of course, no evidence. He, um, and he brought this up using a habeas corpus as a vehicle. Would you do me the, the kind deed and tell me what a habeas corpus is? Sure. A writ of habeas corpus is a petition filed with a court when a person, and it's usually a prisoner, wishes to contest the legality of their custody. And most frequently, a writ of corpus is used as a post-conviction remedy when the person believes the laws are being legal, illegally applied. Uh, or have been illegally applied that resulted in a detention. Doesn't necessarily have to be a detention because they the courts recognize in many jurisdictions and at the federal level that that confinement can be out of custody but still under the restrictions of a sentence. But generally speaking, the person's in custody. They've exhausted all their other judicial remedies, and they it can all be also be used for military detention as well as immigration deportation matters. And, and like I said, it doesn't necessarily require an individual to be in physical custody, but it does in the state of Arkansas. If you're going to file a petition for habeas, you must be in physical custody. Otherwise, you can't. And isn't there like a time limit? You can't file a habeas 50 years later. I think in Texas, if I remember, one of the Texas advocates says there's not a time limit. But under the federal really? habeas, there is a timeline. In most instances, there is a time limit. But in Texas, I think as long as you are suffering any type of custody status, you can file one, but I won't swear to that. Okay. Well, I, I, I believed I'd heard all along that most states, there's some kind of time limit. Three-ish years, like, comes to the forefront of my of my noodle upstairs, uh, uh, how long you might have to? Yes, it's generally a short period of time. And under the federal uh, Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, I think it's one year after you uh, after you exhaust your state remedies. You have to do exhaustion first, going through the state courts, even though you know it won't work. And then I think it's one year from ex post exhaustion. Well, Larry, since he had five different claims which he was going after, y you would think that one of them would be valid, wouldn't you? Not necessarily. Where do you get such a notion? It it just seems like that would be com common sense for me. And uh, I can see that this is not going to be easy to convert you. So in June of 1982, a jury convicted Lane of aggravated rape, and he received a sentence of 10 years imprisonment, probated. He did not appeal. Five years later, in March of 1997, the trial court entered an order terminating Lane's probation and setting aside the conviction of the then-existing Texas Code of Criminal Procedure Article 42.12, Section Number 7, the conviction was set aside in 1987, well before the state of Texas had a PFR registration scheme. So what's your spin from here? Well, he didn't have to register in 1987, so there's no spin. The duty came about many years later. When did the duty for him to register become applicable to Mr. Lane? Well, as you eloquently pointed out, and thanks for doing all your homework, uh, in his conviction in 1982, there was no PFR registration requirements. It wasn't until 1991 that the legislature of Texas enacted the first PFR registration program. As we discussed in the last episode, the laws are frequently changed because they can't help themselves. In 2005, the requirements were made retroactive so that anyone with a reportable conviction occurring on or after 1970 was then required to register. Can you at least admit that 1970 occurred prior to 1982, which would encapsulate Mr. Lane's 1982 conviction. Uh, hang on, let me use my fingers. So 1970, earlier than 82. I think that checks out. Um, but perhaps I can concede that the conduct after 1980, 1970 would include 1982. When did he begin registering as a PFR then? 
Well, he began registering in 1998. And this is in the court. The court noted that Lane was added to the registry for the first time upon his release from prison on a drug charge. Lane registered in April of that year in Pasadena, Texas. While what this tells us is that Lane might not have ever been required to register had he not been sent to prison again for a drug charge. It was the prison doing their due diligence prior to releasing him when they discovered the old 1982 conviction and they notified him of his obligation to register that resulted from the 1995 legislative change. Now let's see, let's do the arithmetic, folks. 1991, they, they enacted the registry. 1991 to 1998, there was no Gestapo that had gone out and found him. He was found upon the release of, of course, they might not have been looking because he was in prison. It's not clear how long he was in prison, but everybody knows that they're just out looking for you. And they discovered him because he was already there and being released. And they do a lot of uh, I, I don't want to say background check. They, they they make sure there aren't holds in other counties and jurisdictions before they just open the door and let you go. So, like this this would then show up, I would imagine. They would find it, his other convictions and then they would flag him as being a PFR. That's exactly what they did. So like I say, it, not knowing how long he was in custody, it's not clear. But certainly he had a large number of years between the time he got discharged and the time the law got changed from 91 to 98, a good seven years that he wasn't registering. The case at hand here was based on a 2007 guilty plea to failure to register. How did that case come about? Well, now that's a funny story. Uh, in April 27, Lane was arrested for another offense. And investigating officers discovered that he was not living at the address where he had previously registered and had not completed his registration requirements in recent years. Again, this bolsters what I'm saying, folks. They're not out looking for you the way you think they are. So he hadn't registered for, uh, he was not where he, the last address was, and he had not only was he not at that address, he had not updated for years. But upon being questioned about this, Lane told the investigating officer that he thought he was no longer required to register based on statements made by an attorney who represented him in another case. The investigating officer disagreed and told Lane that pursuant to provisions of the Code of Criminal Procedure, Chapter 62, he had a lifetime duty to register. If, if you would be so kind, if you can uh, reference page six, it says he signed a form acknowledging this requirement and stated that he would have registered had he known he was required to do so. The officer scheduled an appointment for him to complete his registration. Lane gave his word, in quotes, that he would attend the appointment. He further acknowledged his understanding that the department would pursue criminal charges against him if he missed it. Despite this, Lane failed to appear for the appointment. He failed to show up. Now, can you admit that that's funny? That's just ridiculous. Months later, <laughs> in September 2007, the investigating officer met with Lane to inquire about his registration. Lane told the officer that he had been busy working and did not want his friends to deal with listing their resident as the home of a PFR. Lane was then arrested and charged for a third-degree felony failure to register as a PFR. <laughs> And because of Lane's criminal history, he qualified as a habitual offender and faced a sentence of 25 years to life. By the way, in New Mexico, we have specifically exempted PFR registration from the Habitual Offender Act because it is a civil regulatory scheme. I'm sorry, a what, Larry? A civil regulatory scheme. Oh, oh I'm sorry. And that would be kind of like not criminal punishment? Well, the scheme <laughs> itself is like a civil scheme so therefore it's not like you're out committing new criminal offenses since it's like a civil regulatory scheme so therefore we've got a specific carve out that that cannot be used for habitual enhancement most states do not have this exemption in their statutory scheme this means that a failure to register violation gives the prosecution a really huge bargaining advantage because they can negotiate to not file habitual proceedings if you choose to plead guilty in this case they still have uh, have uh, they still have had the underlying conviction sentencing authority for a third degree fel felony to hold over him, which is significant in Texas. But having the habitual enhancement made it virtually impossible for him to do anything other than a guilty plea. The funny thing is that in New Mexico, the maximum exposure for failure to register is 18 months. Good time credits can reduce that to nine months, even if the court were to impose the maximum sentence, which they seldom do. 
in Georgia, if I'm not mistaken, if you fail your failure to register the first time is a one, and then I think it's five, and then I think it's 30. Well, but, So he missed it, and it was 25 to life? Because habitual enhancement. Because he's a habitual in Georgia, they have habitual enhancement as well. They can they can they can file sure. habitual enhancement, but when you say the one, I don't think that's the maximum exposure. There's no felony in Georgia that carries a maximum exposure of one year, so that may be the okay. Difference. Well, then, then okay, I'll, I'll I'll buy that. That's it's a minimum of one. Yes. All right, but the, I'm talking about maximum exposure. If the judge here maxes you out, the judge can only give you 18 months. I see. Um, the trial court appointed appointed attorney J A. <clears throat> Joe Salinas to represent Lane. Salinas obtained a plea offer from the prosecutor for Lane to serve 10 years in prison despite his habitual offender status. According to Lane, Salinas informed him that the prosecutor was hard on these types of cases and would revoke the 10-year offer if he did not accept it on this day. Do it or die, man, is what that's telling you. Thus, on October 29th, 2007, Lane accepted the offer and, ple and pleaded guilty. Now, can you admit to me, please, that this plea bargain was nothing more than coercion? Uh, no, I cannot do that either. <laughs> so, uh, it was sad, and uh, it was sad. And but the simple reality is that Mr. Lane, he was actually facing 25 years to life as a habitual offender, and Mr. Salinas reduced his exposure to 10 years through negotiations. Mr. Le Mr. Salinas did not create the statutory scheme the citizens of Texas did. He was merely the messenger of, of the bad news. And, and that's combating the idea of ineffective assistance of counsel? Yes. Uh, after serving eight years of the 10-year sentence, Lane was granted parole in August of 2015. While on parole, Lane was again charged with failure to comply with registration requirements. In August 2017, he pleaded guilty to that offense and was sentenced to an additional five years imprisonment to run concurrently with the remainder of his prior sentence. Then something bizarre happened. Would you uh, dig into that one a little bit? I am, um, and folks, you're getting bored listening to all this buildup, but it's essential to make the case uh, come together toward the end. But we normally tell you that this case, it did not resolve well for Mr. Lane, but we're going to great lengths to make you understand why. But according to Lane, in September 2017, two attorneys from the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Office of State Counsel for Offenders contacted him and informed him that the department had determined he, in fact, had no duty to register and would be removed from the registry. They informed him the decision was based on the TDCJ Office of General Counsel and was based on the decision of the Sixth uh, Court of Appeals, and that's a state court of appeals, in the case named Hall versus State, 440 Southwest 3rd at 690. In Hall, a case with nearly factually identical circumstances, the Court of Appeals held that an aggravated rape conviction that had been set aside through judicial clemency under former Article 42.12, Section 7, could not serve as the underlying offense for a failure to register charge. What's your spin on that? That was a decision from the Texas Court of Appeals. You always pontificate that appellate decisions are binding on lower courts. So what's, what's your spin? Well, they are binding, and I have not changed my opinion. They are definitely binding. Unfortunately, we're at the highest court of Texas on this case, and the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals is not a lower court. It's the Supreme Court on criminal matters, and it is not bound by that decision at all. So there's no spin. That's just the reality of the case. It would have been binding on the habeas judge, but it would not have been binding on this court. To reach this conclusion, the Court of Appeals relied on Sueller versus State? Do you think that's Sueller? It would be pronounced Quayar. <laughs> Quayar? Yes. Okay. That's C-U-E-L-L-A-R. Quellar. Quayar. In which this very same court, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, reached a similar holding in a charge for felon in possession of a firearm. They held that because Cuellar's underlying felony conviction was set aside pursuant to the judicial clemency provision, he was not a convicted felon, and thus, there was no predicate felony conviction to support a conviction. The Court of Appeals in Hall applied this reasoning to similarly concede that Hall had no underlying conviction which could serve as the predicate conviction activating the, the sex offender registration requirements. Mr. Spin Doctor, what do you say to that one? Well, I say the law, as it applies to registration, is fairly clear. 
that judicial clemency is not one of those rare exceptions that nullifies a, quote, reportable conviction. That's what I say. Can we uh, dig into the favorable habeas decision that was reversed here? Yes, folks, this is what you're waiting for now. <laughs> All right. So here, here's, the, uh, here's the reveal. The habeas court thus determined that Lane's conviction was not a reportable conviction triggering the requirements to register. Regarding his actual innocence claim, the habeas court similarly reasoned that because Lane did not have a reportable conviction, he did not have a duty to register when he was convicted of that offense, and he should be entitled to relief by having his conviction vacated. And what's wrong with that one? There was nothing wrong with that. That was the correct decision for the habeas court because they were bound by Hall, but of course the state of appeal. So that's what's wrong with it. They're before the final decider. It looks like to me that the stack, the deck was stacked against Mr. Lane. He had a gun held to his head to plead guilty to failure to register both times that uh, and that he pleaded guilty. And the lawyer in the second case should have known about Hall. And can you admit that at least? Uh, yes, I will admit that. Uh, the second charge in 2017, the attorney would have or should have had the knowledge of Hall if he or she had actually done some research because that decision was issued in 2013. Unfortunately for Mr. Lane, that case was, one, not directly on point because it dealt with felon in possession, and two, it was not a decision from the state's highest court, which is where he's at right now for this decision. Nevertheless, I do believe it was ripe at the time to have that decision discussion with the prosecutor, meaning that you would have gone in had he known about it, the attorney. This suggests that the attorney didn't know about it because I'd have gone into the, and I said, well, you know, we got this little problem. We've got this Hall decision. And I don't think in good conscience I can plead my client to this. So I strongly believe that the attorney, certainly by the second case, should have known, and they didn't. And But it turned out not to be relevant. So now that all of the listeners to this, are, their eyes are rolling in the back of their head, it's been 20 minutes of us rambling about this. Can you finally, will you finally have admitted that the attorney in 2017 should have addressed the Hall decision? I believe definitely that the attorney, I can make that admission. I admit that in terms of the second case, but not for the first. As Linus pointed out, the attorney in the first case, the decision from the Court of Appeals in Hall was not issued until 2013, six years after Lane pleaded guilty in that case. And as Linus's view, and I agree, a subsequent Court of Appeals decision and change in administrative policy interpretation does not render his representation ineffective. Simply put, Salinas contends that no one could have anticipated that another defendant years later would successfully challenge the duty to register under these circumstances. But keep in mind, again, the Court of Appeals is not the final decision maker. We need to move to the meat of this decision. And according to the court, the pertinent statute in the Code of Criminal Procedure, Chapter 62, defined a reportable, conv reportable conviction as a conviction or adjudication, including an adjudication of delinquent conduct, or deferred adjudication that, regardless of pendency of an appeal, is a conviction for an adjudication for based on a number of sexual offenses, including the modern-day equivalent of Lane's conviction. And that's in Texas Code of Criminal Procedure, Article 62.001, subsection 5. All right, so I see that, and they said, pursuant to the provision in Chapter 62, a conviction of aggravated sexual assault is subject to a lifetime registration requirement. The claim of ineffective assistance of counsel was validated by the habeas court and reversed by this court. And I don't really understand that. Would you explain why? Uh, explain why it was reversed? Yes, please. Well, uh, I'll read from what the court stated. Applicant, meaning Lane, further contends that but for, but for counsel's ineffectiveness, he would not have pleaded guilty to the failure to register charge. We disagree that applicants entitled to relief on that basis. Viewing the circumstances from counsel's perspective at the time of the representation, the law was unsettled in res respect to whether applicant had a duty to register following the trial court's order setting aside the conviction under the judicial clemency provision because Salinas cannot be deficient for failing to discover something that was unsettled or unclear, applicant cannot establish deficient performance, and that's an important prong of the ineffective assistance claim under Strickland versus Washington. Accordingly, the, the ineffective assistance of counsel claim failed. So that's why that claim was not going, in, it didn't go anywhere. 
Hey, tell me, tell me something from like a uh, law clerk kind of point of view. When there are ongoing cases, what is the ability of the law firm to be aware of ongoing cases? Like they haven't been published yet, so they're not in the whatever published law books, whatever those things would be called. How do you know about ongoing stuff to to see if something would be relevant for you to use now? Well, you couldn't use it as a general rule because it hasn't been decided, but I've never known a way to find out all that stuff because the cases are just difficult to locate. So no attorney has ever told me to research ongoing cases. We are always waiting for a decision. I see. Okay. Well, as we've already discussed, Lane argued that this action by the trial court wiped away his conviction for all purposes, and therefore he had no reportable conviction requiring registration under the applicable statutes in Code of Criminal Procedure, Chapter 62. In support of his position, Lane relied on a decision from the Sixth Court of Appeals in Hall v. State 440, oh God, Southwest 3rd Edition, Section 690? Close enough. Close enough. And they shot that argument down. Can you explain a reportable conviction? I will do my best, but you're going to have to help me. It really comes down to the letter of the law as it's written. As the court stated, while the definition for reportable conviction or adjudication in Article 62.0015 requires anyone who has one of the enumerated types of convictions or adjudication to register, it does not address what circumstances a person ceases to have a conviction or adjudication based on subsequent legal events. But another provision in Chapter 62 does expressly address that matter. And I ask that you read that because your reading is so much better than mine. All right. So we have applicability of chapter provides in relevant part, except as provided by subsection C, the duties imposed on a person required to register under this chapter on the basis of a reportable conviction or adjudication and the corresponding duties and powers of other entities in relation to the person required to register on the basis of that conviction or adjudication are not affected by these couple things. An appeal of the conviction or adjudication or a pardon of the conviction or adjudication. To continue, what I had read was section B, and now this is subsection C. If a conviction or adjudication that is the basis of a duty to register under this chapter is set aside on appeal by a court, or if the person required to register under this chapter on the basis of a conviction or adjudication receives a pardon on the basis of subsequent proof of innocence, the duties imposed by the person by this chapter and the corresponding duties and powers of other entities in relation to this person are terminated. Now, did you... Did you focus in on subsection C very carefully? Because that's where it's noteworthy. The letter I of did, the law, I did. The letter of the law that a pardon must be for actual innocence. Lane's uh, successful completion of probation and ju the judicial remedy is not that judge didn't say, well, now I'm dismissing the case because you were actually innocent and I inappropriately accepted a guilty plea. That was just a mechanism that was in place. But looking at the letter of Texas law, the pardon, uh, a judicial pardon, would not qualify because you have to re have received the pardon on the basis of subsequent proof of actual innocence. Now, sometimes you get pardons just because executives grant them. And I'm not sure what the process is in Texas if an executive can grant a pardon. But he did not receive a pardon for actual innocence. So we're back to what the letter of the law says. I had hoped that this would be the episode that you would finally admit that the court blew it. Um, and appears that this is not going to be that one either. Uh, I don't see how I can admit uh, that when their reasoning is actually sound and consistent with the judicial philosophy of not legislating from the bench. As the court noted, the apparent purpose of this provision is set forth to narrow circumstances under which a person with a reportable conviction or adjudication may be relieved of his or her obligation to register based on events after the conviction or adjudication, and to clarify that certain subsequent events do not absolve a person of a duty to register. According to the statutory terms, a person with a reportable conviction or adjudication is no longer obligated to register if, one, the conviction or adjudication is set aside on appeal by the court or two, the person receives a pardon on the basis of subsequent proof of innocence. 
However, a person's duty to register is not affected by a pending appeal or a non-innocence-based pardon, which is what he got here. I see that on page 17. And then they went on to say, while the statutory terms do not expressly address a final judge's order setting aside a conviction after successful completion of probation, that type of relief plainly does not constitute a reversal of the conviction on appeal by a court, nor is it a pardon based on proof of innocence. And it does not qualify as an exception under Texas law. And under the doctrine of strict interpretation, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals got it right. And I don't know why any of our audience would see it any differently. If you are for strict interpretation and no legislating from the bench, you would be applauding on a megaphone about how wonderful this decision is. All right, I'm going to try this one more time, Larry. One more time. All right. The habeas court determined that because the Hall decision relied on this court's reasoning from its 2002 decision in Cuellar, Cuellar should have led uh, Salinas, the attorney, to conclude that the applicant's aggravated rape conviction that had been judicially set aside was not a reportable conviction. And what's your justification for that? Well, I'll just let the court be. They stated, we disagree with the habeas court's analysis in Cuellar as it pertains to these circumstances. In Cuellar, this court considered whether a felony conviction that had been set aside under former Code of Criminal Procedure Article 42.12, Section 20, which is nearly identical to the previous version of the statute under the applicant's conviction, was set aside, could serve as a predicate conviction for a felon in possession charge. We held that it could not. Doing so, we reasoned that a person whose conviction is set aside pursuant to an Article 42.12.20 order is not a convicted felon, and thus the appellant there could not have been a felon in unlawful possession of a firearm under the applicable terms of that section. They went on to say, even if Salinas had been aware of Cuellar, that decision would not have clearly indicated one way or another that applicants set aside aggravated rape conviction was not a report conviction for purposes of duty to register. You are, uh, I don't know how else to put it. You're just hopeless. Now what? <laughs> Well, in my opinion, this is the end of the appellate process. So the next step is to convince the Texas legislature to change the law. Oh, I know. What, what, what are the odds of that? <laughs> I'd say that the uh, odds are very low because of uh, the state of Texas law and the court noted uh, that uh, they stated it is also worth emphasizing that the legislature has amended judicial clemency provision to now provide that sexual assault convictions are explicitly exempted from eligibility for judicial clemency. And they give the section there. And an offense or conviction which requires registration for a PFR, all those are now excluded by Texas statute. So for them to do an about face, I think would be most unlikely. Um, so just to kind of recap, in 1970, I think it was, he had his first conviction of things. That's, that's right? 1987. Oh, then what was 1970? Nin what was that way back? 1970s when they amended, uh, after they passed the oh. first Registration Act in 1991. Then they came back in 1995 and expanded the clawback uh, provision for anybody convicted after 1970. I forget what day in 1970, but they made it retroactive. Oh, I see. Okay, but so his... But his Original first conviction was prior to them uh, having registration that, that clawed people backwards. It was even prior to having a registration scheme, period. It was four years prior. To have, okay. Uh, so and, no, telling, no telling when the conduct occurred. So it was years before they had registration. And so had he not been naughty along the way, they never would have found him to begin with, which is kind of like the other stories that we've talked about where people call the registry office and go and ask them if they have to register multiple times. It's kind of similar. It is very similar. And I don't encourage that behavior, but I'm telling you, this guy probably would have lived his life successfully had he just stayed out of trouble, but he couldn't stay out of trouble for whatever his reasons were. And he brought this on himself. And I would say looking at the way the court would have looked at this, with all of his encounters with difficulty registering and other criminal convictions, he would be the last person they would want to grant any relief to. Yeah, no kidding. 
No kidding. All right. And so this isn't good news for anybody, really. It would not fall into that category. I was just trying to give some explanation because it was so much chatter about it, about how crazy the, the opinion was. It's not that crazy at all. I would have preferred a different outcome. But in a state of Texas, with all the judiciary, I think even all the appellate, all the way through the Supreme Court, they're all elected. And I just don't think that Texans are ready to elect an activist court on particularly as it pertains to criminal matters. Now, they're probably happy to have activism when it comes to personal rights and privacy rights and stuff like that, but like well, uh, women's choice. Uh, but in terms of this, I just don't see Texans being ready for that. So I think you're going to be stuck with this ruling for a long time to come. Very, very well. Are you a first-time listener of Registry Matters? Well, then make us a part of your daily routine and subscribe today. Just search for Registry Matters through your favorite podcast app, hit the subscribe button, and you're off to the races. You can now enjoy hours of sarcasm and snark from Andy and Larry on a weekly basis. Oh, and there's some excellent information thrown in there, too. Subscribing also encourages others of you people to get on the bandwagon and become regular Registry Matters listeners. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe to Registry Matters right now. Help us keep fighting and continue to say F-Y-P. Let's move along to an article that comes from uh, CBS News. It's an amazing story. And it is. it reads, a New York man was officially exonerated on Tuesday, 47 years after he was found guilty of rape in 1976. The longest standing wrongful conviction to be overturned based on new DNA evidence in U.S. history. A DNA hit conclusively excluded Leonard Mack, who is now 72 years old, as the perpetrator, Westchester County District Attorney Miriam E. Roca said in a statement. Conviction review unit investigators identified a convicted sex offender uh, after they ran the DNA through the databases, and the DA's office said that the individual has now confessed to the rape. Yeah, this is something I don't know anything about suburbs of New York because I've never even been there. I usually spew about Atlanta and Denver and places where I've lived, but I happen to know a little bit about Westchester County because back in the 80s, I bought an initial public offering stock of a financial institution that was based there. And I remember from the perspective just that it was a very, I was the DA now, Miriam Roach, she quote, is quoted as saying, this exoneration confirms that wrongful convictions are not only harmful to the wrongfully convicted, but also make us all less safe. Now, that's been my position for years. I don't know why prosecutors strive so hard to hang on to a wrongful conviction. Because if there's credible evidence that the conviction shouldn't have been had, you have a culprit running around loose, and the community, including me and you, we're less safe. I don't know why you'd want to hang on to a wrongful conviction. I mean, doesn't it just show some level of incompetency? To, uh, that's probably not even the right word, but just like, oops. I think it does that. But for her to make that Pride. statement— Pride. That's the word. Pride is the word. For, for Miriam Roach to make that statement— that's just astounding because DAs don't say stuff like that as a general rule. She's recognizing that the community is less safe. My job is to try to make my community more safe. And if I've got a wrongfully convicted person here, I need to get the rightfully convicted person behind bars. You would think. And but Larry, we all know that there's thousands of rape kits sitting in the police uh, lockers, whatever they're called, evidence lockers, thousands across the country. Absolutely. And, and this man served 47 years. I think I wrote that wrong, but after 47 and a half years. Uh, yeah, well, no, it's, it's in there that he was convicted in 76 and 47 years afterwards. Um, but anywho, Mac, who served seven and a half years in prison for the crime, said, I never lost hope that one day I would be proven innocent. So this guy's lived for almost 50 years with that sitting on his Everything that he would ever do from that point forward as far as like filling out job applications and stuff like that, everything that somebody looks at him would show that he 
raped somebody. That is what, and that's where I miswrote it there, 47 years is what he served. And that's amazing to have that kind of attitude after 40, nearly 50 years. Everybody would have lost hope. I mean, you're telling everybody and they're saying, yeah, right. And uh, so, yeah, it's just, just an amazing story. And then on May 22nd, 1975, police pulled over Mac in Greenboro, New York, two and a half hours after two teenage girls were stopped as they were walking home from school. One teen was violently violated. The other teen broke free and ran to a nearby school where a teacher called the police. The attack happened in a predominantly white neighborhood. The Greenberg Police Department had put out a call for a black male suspect, suspect in his early 20s, the statement said. This is so tragic. So, I mean, like... Larry, do you know that there's only one or two 20-ish year old black men in the country? Well, in that particular part of the country, that was the point I was making from what I remember about that perspective, prospectus on the stock offering. That that suburb is pretty affluent, and there wouldn't have been a whole lot of black people there. But again, I've not been there, so people can correct me if I've got it all wrong. I just it, <laughs> we, We've covered stories where you have a very common name, and you are a predominantly African-American black descent and you live in this neighborhood and your name's like John Williams. And like, so yeah, you're, 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 there's probably somebody nearby you that has a conviction. So you're just kind of guilty because your parents gave you a, a common name. Makes sense to me. Perfect. Easy peasy. All right, let's move over to an article from NPR. Uh, the judge has sentenced that that 70s show actor Danny Masterson to 30 years to life in prison for L. The same thing that we talked about a second ago, but for two women. This has been a long and arduous road for the victims of Mr. Masterson, read a statement from the district attorney, George Gascon? Gascon? I don't know what that little symbol would be for the name. Anywho, so Gascon, maybe? Um, correct. correct. They not only survived... I'm sorry? That is correct. Oh, okay. Gascon. They not only survived his abuse, they also survived a system that has uh, not often kind to victims. And so I'm just curious, why are we covering this one? Well, first of all, because I have no idea who the hell that is. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> it shows that California is really tough on sentencing of PFRs. And uh, you know, like I say, who the hell is he? But uh, see, uh, it also shows you that uh, DA Gascon is on the bandwagon that victims are being oppressed by a system and he wants to make more rights for the victims and fewer rights for the accused. That's what I could read between the lines here. I, I have, I, I don't even know that I've ever watched the show all the way through, but so in the, probably in the two thousands or even like the early teens, they had a show Larry that took place in the seventies and they came up with the incredibly unique name for it. It was called that seventies show. So everyone's wearing like, uh, plaid pants up to their elbows and uh you know driving in volkswagen minibuses and whatnot and so the show ran from 1998 to 2006 he was the first accused of sexual misconduct in 2017 which kicked off an investigation by the los angeles police department in june 2020 he was charged with uh that 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 deed of three women including his former girlfriend in his hollywood hills home between 2001 and 2003 lovely so, yes, well, they're not particularly lenient in the terms in this case. Uh, you can talk about how progressive Los Angeles is, but this doesn't sound like a particularly lenient sentence to me. Another one from Minnesota is, uh, uh, good grief. I've just read the title. A new Minnesota law restores voting rights to thousands of felony offenders. And this falls into the new good news category and just wanted to mention that this is happening. Do you, what would you like to comment on this one? Apparently, I listened to a little snippet of the interview, and they're actually setting up a mechanism to register these, register these voters as they exit prison. And that's phenomenal that a corrections department would do that. But what would you expect from a lifty bunch of Looney Tunes in Minnesota? Uh, I don't think uh, Minnesota's pretty much like right on the fence. There's uh, Minneapolis would be certainly liberal that way, but I don't think the rest of the state is. So, yeah, well, we got one more article to go, and then we'll be out. I know. There. Very good. All right. So, this last one from Reason. Fantastic publication, by the way. Um, yeah, God. This one is with a 22-year sentence, ex-Proud Boys leader Enrique Tarrio pays hefty trial penalty. Larry, what's most interesting to me is that he was not there on January 6th. He was not present. That's well, the most amazing thing from this whole story. Well, but, I, don't, I don't know the details, but it is 
it exemplifies what we just talked about and we'll go into a little bit here. Very good. Yet another Proud Boy is paying a hefty trial penalty for January 6th. On Tuesday, a federal judge in Washington, D.C. sentenced former Proud Boys leader Enrique Terrio to 22 years in prison for his part in organizing organizing, not participating, organizing the 2021 protest riot that obstructed Congress's ratification of Joe Biden's victory in the 2020 presidential election. And I do have to ask you, why in the flippity flip are we talking about this? Why is this relevant? We really don't want to talk about it from a political point of view, but it, it proves my point about the benefits of a plea agreement, as we just talked about in the case of, of uh, the uh, 25 to life was taken off the table by a plea agreement and Texas, and since uh, uh, since he was convicted, rather than entered into a negotiating plea, this this case here we're talking about, there there were no limitations. The the full plethora of sentencing options were available. Prosecutors had sought it, even a longer sentence. They had sought a 33 uh, year sentence, but U.S. District Judge Timothy Kelly declined to go that far. But he did slap uh, Terrio with a sentencing enhancement for committing an act of terrorism. And if yep. the exposure is there, it will be used. Folks, you've got to limit your exposure unless you're confident of acquittal. It's so unfortunate that I've been hearing all the conservatives complaining about the stiff sentences, but it is actually they who created the federal sentencing guidelines that we're operating under today. They created them back in 1984. It would be so wonderful if they would be willing to go back and look at the mess that they helped make then and change the law rather than vilifying the judge. That's my point. You created a system where you had this as a certain outcome, and the lefties have been complaining about this system for many, many years when the federal prison exp uh, population exploded from 20,000 in 1981 to just around shy or right at 200,000 by the time Obama was in uh, the Oval Office. So a tenfold increase. And we've been sounding the alarm bell about the excessive sentences in the federal system. And now, magically, they're blaming the judge for what they created. That's the relevance. I'm going to put an image up on the screen there. Um, uh, let me stop the rotator doodad and get to that. Can you can you see my screen? I can see that, absolutely. Um, and crap, let me turn off that. Darn it, that's going to be hard to turn off. Um, there, so th at the bottom of that, where that, that hockey stick kind of goes up, that's 1984. That is, that is correct. And what was odd is you look back 40 years, the federal prison population had hovered around the 20,000 range, going up or down a couple thousand for 40 years. And this is what the 1984 Sentencing Reform Act gave us. The conservatives told us this was our salvation. Now, they're mad about what they created. That's what's funny. Um, I believe that that closes this uh, fantastic episode of Registry Matters out. Do you have anything you want to uh, jib-jab about before we close out? We need to get our uh, subscription uh, numbers up for the transcripts, or we may have to disengage from that. So everybody that's receiving them, find us more subscribers, because it's not cost-effective to continue this. It's also a massive pain in the butt. Yeah. So, yeah, we want to provide the service, but we need far more subscribers to spread out the cost than what we have. Well, on that happy note, Larry, I hope you have a fantastic weekend. You got any plans? I don't have any plans other than coming in tomorrow to do the transcript. <laughs> um, as always, we record on Saturday night, somewhere pretty close to 7 p.m. Eastern time, because as I always say, that's the only time zone that matters, unless I'm in a different one, like in Houston, Texas, which is in Central. But otherwise, it's 7 p.m. Eastern. And then the podcast comes out for the patrons pretty much tomorrow, which would be Sunday, unless, again, I'm in Houston or something like that. But then for everyone else that's not a patron, you get it around Tuesday or so. Best effort comes up on YouTube there as well. You can find it by searching for Registry Matters pretty much everywhere, and you'll find it. You can find the show notes at registrymatters.co. Uh, sh uh, the show notes are the transcript and stuff. Transcript you can find over at fypeducation.org. Email me. And I will pass it over to Larry at registrymatterscast at gmail.com if you have a question that you'd like to ask. And I think that about does it. And I think I will then bid you a farewell. And I hope you have a great weekend, Larry. Thank you. Good night.
You've been listening to F.Y.P.